and welcome to Autocracy Now. As part of our series on Huey P. Long, this is episode 3, School Books and Blood. In 1928, Huey Long was riding high. He'd beaten all opposition and achieved the second step in his life plan. Get elected to minor public office, check. Get elected to the governorship, check. There's little doubt, given that everything we know about him, that he was already angling for a seat in the Senate, the next on his list. Although, in his early addresses, he was already lying about ridding the state of corruption and waste without ambition for ever again holding another public office. A bold claim for a man who had become president on his to-do list. But in order to do that, he would have to deliver on his outlandish promises that he'd made in the campaign to be governor. He had to keep his base on side and prove that he wasn't the lying demagogue that his hated media constantly portrayed him to be. In the meantime, the powers that be in the state of Louisiana dusted themselves off and began strategizing. How could they manipulate the young and experienced governor to keep their interests on side? They had dealt with demagogues before. Huey was not unique in that respect, although few of them so far had made it to his lofty position. But confidence was probably high amongst the establishment, that most of them thought they could work with Huey, that things would continue more or less as they had before, and in a few years, promises largely broken, the political machines could wrestle back control from this interloper. This was how many people thought it was going to go. A lot of them were mistaken. Huey's first violation of the political norms of the state began almost immediately when he took office. Traditionally, one of the first things a new governor did was call a convention where delegates to the National Party convention were selected. So, here is a good degree of Louisiana horse trading. Every party member and faction was traditionally doled out its fair share of delegates, and a roughly equal number from all of the political factions would attend and be represented in Washington. But Huey couldn't allow this to happen. His leadership would be undermined if his political opponents were representing the state on the national level. Remember, he has these national ambitions. He can't make it seem like Louisiana is anything other than behind him. But Huey, well, Huey checked the state constitution. It described this democratic process by which you could choose these delegates, but it didn't legally require that you did things that way. In fact, there were few requirements at all. It was perfectly legal under the constitution for a small, centralised committee to choose the delegates. So, Huey formed this committee. Promising everyone on the committee a cushy job and maybe engaging in a few other backroom deals, Huey won round a majority of them. So two votes happened in quick succession. The first dispensed with the Democratic Convention to pick delegates, and the second approved a list of delegates that had been hand-picked by Huey. Naturally, all of his prominent opponents, all the people associated with the old regular political machine, they were all left out. The fix was in, and the Democratic Party of Louisiana would be represented by Huey Long loyalists that year. One of the characteristics of Huey's use, or possibly abuse, of power is how brazen he was in doing it. This is one of the areas where it really depends on how you fall down on the question of Huey's real intentions. If you support him, you'll buy his argument that he has a mandate from the people, that he's sweeping aside corrupt and unfair institutions, that he's getting rid of bloated, ineffective government. And why shouldn't he do this proudly? But if you're against him, you see it as a flagrant and dangerous disregard for tradition, democracy, and the opposition that shows him as a dictator in the making. Stifling debate, forcing through votes, these happen constantly in Huey's career, but is it undemocratic or just anti-opposition? But the thing about Huey Long is that he rarely did any of this behind closed doors, none of it was secret. In the end, regardless of motivation, the result was the same and the impotent bleating of his undermined opponents made little impression. Quote, They say they were steamrolled, said Huey a week after the coup. I think that's true. The only reason the roller didn't pass over more of them was that there were no more in the way. I had promised my people that I would put this gang of bosses and plunderbun pie-eaters out of control of the Democratic Party just as quickly as I could. We hesitated very little about it. In this incident, Huey used a legal technicality, a loophole in the Constitution, to get his own way. Even though this wasn't the way things traditionally had been done, and it was a considerable seizure of power by the governor, it was still within the letter of the law. But this was not always the case. When Huey interrupted a meeting of state senators, one of them sarcastically threw him a copy of the state Constitution. Have you heard of this book? he said. The riposte from Huey, as ever, was swift. I'm the Constitution just now. Constitution or no, Huey really needed to take control of the state legislature. Although he'd run as part of a ticket, 
there were only really 18 out of 108 delegates that you could really describe as pro-long at the start. But at the same time, there were only a few vehemently anti-long delegates. The rest were waiting, in time-honoured Louisiana fashion, to see who would value their loyalty the most, who could pay the highest price. He made use of his governor's privilege to appoint men to key positions, alongside his skills at horse trading with the opposition to sway the loyalties of individual delegates. Under the guise of kicking the rascals out, as he put it, he handpicked the Speaker of the House, Jean Fournet, the President of the Senate, Philip Gilbert. Huey had run with a slate of delegates on his side, including some of the state legislatures, and his deputy governor, Dr Paul Sear. Remember Robert Maestri, the sleazy backer who funded Huey's campaign? He was appointed head of the Department of Conservation. Again, technically, things were usually decided by negotiation, horse trading, and they ended up more or less evenly split between the various factions in the Democratic Party. But this time, the leaders of the House and Senate had the authority to name committee members. Traditionally, the legislature got to nominate its own committee members, so these would be the committees that would take care of things like agriculture, fund appropriation, that kind of things. But Huey nominated his childhood friends to these positions. He personally told the House and Senate leaders who to appoint to every committee. Huey had come up through this minor state legislature, and he knew the ins and outs, and he knew the powers that could be brought to bear from seemingly dull, boring offices. Harley Bozeman, a friend from Wynn Parish, was in charge of the House Appropriations Committee. The prolonged delegates on the House floor would be led by O.K. Allen, another close friend and confidant of Huey's. Allen and Bozeman had been with Huey since he was a nobody from Wynn County, and they were tasked with figuring out who in the legislature was on his side, who was dead opposed, who could be swayed, and how. At the centre of the whirlwind, in the hot Louisiana sun, Huey and his inner circle worked tirelessly towards these ends, scoping out every angle of unfair advantage. Thanks, John Daniel. Huey's secretary, Alice Lee, was one of the chosen few who were constantly in contact with Huey. More than a few salacious rumours were sparked after her divorce in 1928. Key to Huey's plan was a constant supply of cushy jobs that he could offer to his supporters. You have to remember that Louisiana was in the depths of poverty even before the Wall Street crash of 1929. So the state government was a huge sector of the economy. The jobs they could offer were vital to many people's livelihoods, to their families. The governor personally controlled some jobs, but Huey made it his mission to take over as many of the state commissions as he possibly could and stuff them with prolonged loyalists. It might seem that having control over the Conservation Commission, the Board of Health, the Highway Commission, it's all fairly administrative, all of which are things that Huey targeted. It might seem that having these commissions wouldn't necessarily give you that much political power compared to having more people in the legislature or more judges on your side. If you didn't know how this system of patronage worked, you might question why Huey spent so much time making sure he had the majority on, say, the board of a hospital, the board of a university, or a school. These things were major political coups for Huey. You might question why, in the early days, he spent time micromanaging these institutions, firing traffic cops and port officials who disagreed with him and replacing them with long loyalists. But Huey realised and recognised that these institutions would give him the supply of patronage jobs that he needed to sway people over to his camp. Everything that could become politicised, everywhere he could command loyalty, he wanted it. There were some jobs that he wouldn't touch, those that needed genuine specialists to operate them were left alone. Huey was no fool, he'd occasionally tolerate dissent amongst people who were too useful to be eliminated. But what he was doing was using the powers of his office to construct a vast, corrupt machine of personally loyal clients. You could argue that he needed control over all these boards to push through his radical agenda without opposition. You could argue that, as governor, he would be held ultimately responsible for what state-owned or state-funded institutions did, and that therefore he had a right to exert some influence over them. Huey would argue that all he was doing was kicking out corrupt and ineffective bureaucrats and officials, and in a sense he was, it's just that he was replacing them with his own. What can't be denied is that he amassed a lot of power this way. By the time he was finished, thousands of people across the state would owe their jobs and their loyalty directly to one man. What's more, they all had to pay a portion of their salary to fund Huey's future political campaigns. In Huey, the state had a governor who was willing to use every trick in the book to enhance his own power, and who moved with a swiftness that his opponents could hardly respond to. Bills or lists of candidates for office would be swiftly and mysteriously introduced into the middle of legislative sessions. Just as quickly, 
Often before anyone had any time to read them and digest them, they would go to a majority vote that Huey would win. Huey had other tactics. When a backlog of legislation built up which slowed Huey's bills down, he would order his delegates to vote in favour of everything, just blanket across the board, everything gets a yes vote. And in the space of a couple of hours, the entire backlog had been completely cleared, and the legislature, they staggered out after passing dozens of bills. They didn't quite know what to make of it. Suddenly, the long faction which had opposed them all the time was pliable. Later, Huey would look through all of the bills, because he had the governor's constitutional power to veto any bill, and he vetoed the ones that had been proposed by his opponents. Normally the veto was only used in very extreme circumstances, but Huey just blanket wielded it. Previous governors, they'd usually allow little things that their opponents supported to go through. A lot of them were operating on the same system of patronage as the governor himself. So if you represented a town, maybe you'd promise them a new road. And usually the state legislature was happy to help each delegate pass their own bill, so that they might stand a chance at re-election. If you'd ever opposed Huey, though, he'd make you pay for it. Like a politician who would be famous a few generations down the road, Huey kept an enemies list. Again, there was nothing technically illegal about this swaggering wielding of the veto in the Constitution, but it was a dictatorial use of the legal powers that Huey did have, and it hurt a lot of people. Of course, all of this was part of getting people on side. After all, if you couldn't fulfil your campaign promises without Huey, well, maybe the better the devil you know. Quote, there were men in the legislature that, that went over to him that I never thought would go. He must have bought them or got something on them, one shell-shocked opponent reflected years later. If a member of your family worked for the government, Huey was not above using that as leverage. Nice job your son has there would be a shame if something were to happen to it. He took steps to ensure that all of the new appointees to the boards were completely under his thumb. Before they took office, Huey made them write and sign letters of resignation with no date. If the new employee ever disappointed Huey, he'd fill in the date and mail himself the letter. Amongst the people whom Huey gave jobs to were members of his own family. This nepotism is common amongst dictators, so his brother, Earl Long, found himself in a $15,000 a year job as an inheritance tax collector. For reference, that was twice Huey's salary as governor. Huey had promised on the campaign trail that this position would be abolished and the money used to construct a TB hospital, but of course that TB hospital just turned out to be money for his brother. A couple of dozen of Huey's relatives found themselves in government jobs. Again, Huey was brazen about what he was doing. When people accused him of nepotism and said, you know, you're hiring members of your own family, he bragged that he would have hired more members of his own family if some of them hadn't been in prison. In Huey's own glowing autobiography, he describes the patronage that he's using here as, quote, the spoils of war, end quote. It's quite a thing to run on an anti-corruption platform and then install your own corrupt bureaucracy. In a typical quote, he explains how constructing his machine was necessary for the good of the people. They say they don't like my methods. Well, I don't like them either. I really don't like having to do things the way I do. I'd much rather get up before the legislature and say, now this is a good law and it's for the benefit of the people, and I'd like you to vote for it in the interest of the public welfare. Only I know that laws ain't made that way. You've got to fight fire with fire. This is the polarisation at work. If you decided that Huey was on your side, you would admire his brazenness as evidence that he was sticking it to the man. You'd be willing to defend what he was doing, even when it was morally dubious, because, after all, everyone else was worse, right? So we have to ask ourselves, given that he was consolidating power, what did he actually do with it, aside from enriching himself and his family, of course? One of the bills established a dodgy-sounding Bureau of Criminal Identification. This effectively established an independent police force. They would have sweeping powers to make arrests anywhere in the state of Louisiana, without warrants for all violations of the law. Who controlled the appointments to this shadowy police force? The governor, of course. The new law enforcement and the National Guard of Louisiana, which Huey used to his own advantage, well, they became instruments for the settling of political scores. Colonel Ewing, the wealthy newspaper owner, remember him? And Sullivan, who controlled the New Orleans faction. These were the people who'd supposed to be loyal to Huey, and they'd failed him. They delivered very few votes, and Huey felt betrayed. So it will come as little surprise to you to learn that Huey had their gambling houses and brothels raided, without a warrant in the middle of the night. The money his men collected from the gambling parlours was sweet. Revenge was probably sweeter, 
but now Huey had no faction in New Orleans. But in terms of enacting his populist promises, the ones that had really got him elected, the school textbooks, the roads, the hospitals, Huey needed money that the state just didn't have. The solution was classic long. There was to be a severance tax on all the oil taken from Louisiana oil wells. Huey was never going to get the backing of Standard Oil, so he might as well double down on the attacks on them as governor and use them to fund his programme. After all, this was exactly in line with what he said he'd do, tax the greedy corporations. But feuding with Standard Oil wasn't the same as bullying some individual state legislature by threatening his pet pork barrel project or, or outwitting or outpoliticking the dumbfounded politicians of New Orleans. They had plenty of men whose jobs depended on them, and they had that team of crack lawyers that Huey had come up against before. Standard Oil were going to fight back. When the severance tax, which would have raised $2 million a year, much of it coming straight from Standard Oil profits, was proposed, the company sued, saying that the tax was unconstitutional. This put Huey in a bind. The new school year was approaching, and while the legal battle over the tax continued, the state didn't have the money to pay for the school books. If he couldn't deliver on his key campaign pledge, his opponents would have all the fuel they needed to denounce him. So Huey negotiated for a loan from a New Orleans bank for half a million dollars to pay for the books. The bank, mistrustful of this brash young demagogue, told Huey that such a loan would be illegal. There was no guarantee that the state would win the case and be able to pay them back. Quick as a flash, Huey came up with a riposte. Did you know that the state owns your bank? Did you know that the state owes your bank $935,000 on these loans just now? If it's illegal to make them, it's illegal to pay them. We'll keep the $935,000 and have money to spare after paying for my books. He was threatening to default on a loan of nearly a million dollars, and such was his reputation that no one was quite sure if he'd do it or not. In the end, the bank weren't sure. The bank backed down, the money was loaned, and the school books were delivered on time. Huey described the event. No accomplishment of my career has given me such satisfaction. I imagine that maybe this wasn't entirely true. You've got to remember that the Huey who said that was the Saint Huey from his autobiography. But even if it wasn't really the happiest moment of Huey's life to deliver school books to smiling children, it was a coup, and undeniably a popular success. 600,000 school books had been delivered to the poor children of Louisiana. The big oil companies looked set to pay. It's a Robin Hood story that it's really difficult to disapprove of. One of the school kids wrote to Huey, You're the only governor of Louisiana who has done what you said you'd do. His methods were unscrupulous, but in this instance he did an unquestionably good thing. The motives are what you can and maybe should question. Other governors had promised to deliver natural gas to the city of New Orleans too. In his first year, Huey managed it. The old regulars of New Orleans were no fans of the proposal. They controlled the lucrative monopoly on artificial gas that heated and powered much of the city. But Huey outmaneuvered them, forcing the legislation through the state senate and accusing them of artificially keeping prices high for the people of Louisiana. Once again, the political machines were defeated and forced to concede, and Huey had fulfilled another promise. The next item on the agenda was roads. Louisiana's roads had long been a disgrace for the state. Many areas were still in the mud in 1928, but no former governor had been able or willing to raise taxes in order to pay for new ones. Huey couldn't either, with his oil tax still trying to work its way through the courts, but he managed to raise funds for his infrastructure programme by selling state bonds. The state was effectively going into debt to pay for his programme. He could only raise a modest $30 million this way, nowhere near enough for a project on the vast scale that he'd envisioned, but he hoped that the people would get a taste for good roads, and then there would be popular support for the taxes to fund the rest. But when his vote on the bond bill went through, he was two men short of the two-thirds majority that he needed for such a spending amendment. Huey, having spent the last few weeks negotiating with individual members, well, he lost his patience. The two recalcitrant legislators who failed to show up for the bill were marched to the house by state policemen. Huey's tactics were brutal, bullying, and violated every democratic norm in the book. But they got the job done and made him a hero amongst his supporters. Huey had brought the exact same mix of unscrupulous wheeler dealing and frenetic energy to the office of governor as he had brought to every other endeavour he'd tackled in life. When he found the Louisiana governor's mansion to be dilapidated and not to his liking, 
he ordered it to be torn down. His conservative critics were aghast at the sight, as Huey ordered convicts from a local prison to tear down the old house. A new one would be built to Huey's specification. It's difficult to imagine a more symbolic act that he could have undertaken, but his ruthless, dictatorial and uncooperative steamroller methods further alienated many of his fellow politicians and many of the wealthy elites. He even managed to alienate his own lieutenant governor, Paul Sear, who had run on the same ticket as him less than a year ago. It was illegal for a governor to succeed himself if he'd served a full term, so Sear had probably hoped for Huey's endorsement for 1932. But when he discovered that Huey had no intention of endorsing him, their relations soured. And then they both became embroiled in a notorious murder case. A man named James LaBeouf, no relation to Shire as far as I know, took his wife out boating one summer evening. Then the man turned up dead. According to more lurid accounts, he was shot by his wife's lover, a Dr. Dreyer, and his handyman, Jim Beadle. Beadle gave evidence to the state and was sentenced to life imprisonment, but Dreyer and Mrs. LaBeouf, for conspiracy to murder, were sentenced to death. Huey was happy to sign the warrant, calling it a conscienceless murder, but Sear felt differently. Dreyer was a personal friend, and besides, the sentence was very controversial with the state and the media divided over what should happen to the pair. Dreyer was well liked, and the state had never before hanged a white woman. Sear came down on the side of Dreher and Mrs. LaBeouf, and threatened that if Huey left the state, he would commute their sentences as acting governor. Huey quotes him in his autobiography as saying, How long have I been humiliated in having to deal with this man? Which seems like he's smearing Sear, saying that Sear was an elitist. In the end, though, Huey didn't leave the state. Not for the first time, he had to stay in the state to avoid Sears' influence. In the end, Huey got his way, and the pair were hanged. But his break with Dr. Sear was irreparable. In March of 1929, after a year of being in office, Huey had some substantial achievements under his belt. In terms of his campaign promises, the roads were underway and the school books had been delivered. These policies were wildly popular with the electorate that had swept into victory. In terms of politicking, a third of the state's employees were personally loyal to him. But he knew that he needed that standard oil money to keep his projects going. And so in March of 1929, he called a special session of the legislature to try and force through a new tax that would hit the hated Invisible Empire. This oil processing tax would raise $3 million from Standard Oil alone. It's worth remembering at this point, Huey has this vendetta with Standard Oil, and it stretches way back to his early legal days. He even invested in oil stocks that Standard had crashed when he was worth only a few thousand dollars. The corporation, too, was an easy target for Huey's populist, anti-corporate rhetoric. And indeed, in a lot of ways, it did exert massive influence over states and was eventually disbanded as being unconstitutional a few years later. But it was not just the corporation's political machine that was opposed to Huey. Many people worked for Standard Oil, and the company was threatening layoffs if the tax went through. And the legislatures who represented the oil-producing regions, well, they knew that voting for the tax would alienate their voters who could lose their jobs. The conservatives and the wealthy, they were deeply opposed to the tax. Previous hikes, had, they'd increased existing taxes marginally, but this was a completely new tax. Even some of Huey's closest friends and associates were concerned. His old school friend, Harley Bozeman, said that he thought this new tax was maybe a bridge too far. But Huey didn't listen. He was determined to steamroll through this new tax, just as he'd done with everything else, against any opposition. But maybe for the first time in his entire political career, Huey had misjudged the situation. When the initial count took place in the legislature, he realised that he didn't have enough votes. Things got increasingly heated as the session wore on. The Standard Oil men arrived with, in Huey's words, enough money to burn a wet mule and they began allegedly dispensing bribes to people who might have voted. They threatened to shut down their refinery in Baton Rouge, the state capital. This refinery employed over a quarter of the workers in that city. The newspapers trumpeted this threat and called it a spite tax. Huey dragged out the legislative session for longer and longer. Sear, now his bitter enemy, accused him of feathering his family nest. He threw doubt on Huey's dealings with oil companies. 
and it's true that Huey had leased some oil-rich land to Texas in a deal that always seemed fishy. He denounced Huey as the worst political tyrant to rule the state. Even his own deputy was now on the attack. Huey fought back, but not in a particularly honourable way. A Baton Rouge publisher received a veiled threat from Huey. If you don't lay off me, I'll publish a list of the names of the people who have relatives in the insane asylum. He knew that the publisher's brother was in a state mental hospital. The publisher, though, was not going to be threatened. He published Huey's threat. This is the way your governor fights, he wrote in an editorial. I might say that my brother is the same age as the governor. He was in France in 1918, wearing the uniform of a United States soldier, while Long was campaigning for office. Resorting to such awful tactics as to shame a mentally ill man shows how desperate Huey had become. But astonishingly, he doubled down on his attacks on the publisher and his brother. Quote, They say I should leave him alone because shell shock caused his illness. Have you ever heard of shell shock causing syphilis? End quote. He rounded on the legislators who opposed the tax, implying they were bought and paid for by Standard Oil. But Huey went too far. There were legitimate reasons to oppose the tax on economic grounds, and people had to represent their constituents who worked for Standard Oil. Later, in his autobiography, he would say, rats began to leave the sinking ship. The newspapers began to call for his impeachment. The Standard Oil man who was in town lobbying advised his opponents, if you're going to impeach him, do it right now. If you wait, he's smart enough to think up a way to beat you. The legislators who opposed his tax included one J.Y. Sanders, who you'll remember had to put up with Huey's lurid allegations on the campaign trail last episode. Together, this band of anti-long impeachers even had a catchy nickname. They called themselves the Dynamite Squad. There was no end to the lurid allegations. Sanders and his crew claimed to have a sworn affidavit from Huey's ex-bodyguard. According to this document, Huey had ordered the assassination of Sanders. I mean for you to kill the son of a bitch. Leave him in the dirt where nobody will know when or how he got there. I'm the governor of this state and if you were to be found out, I'd give you a full pardon and many gold dollars. At least that's what the statement said that Huey had said. The historians disagree over whether this is completely made up, whether Huey said it in a drunken rage but didn't mean for it to be taken seriously, or whether it was a genuine threat. I can believe either one of the first two, as in maybe it's made up or maybe it was a drunken comment. Huey liked a drink, but at this point his nerves must have been shot. For the first time since he was a dirt poor salesman walking alongside a railroad track, he was seeing a major reversal in his fortunes. And here again, it depends which Huey you believe in. His dream for a more fair and just America, where people would be lifted from poverty by taxes on the rich and the corporations. Well, this was crumbling in front of his eyes. Or alternatively, his dream, public office, governor, senator, president, was crumbling before his eyes. It's not unbelievable that when he was in his cups, he would have yelled for Sanders' blood. He was one of the ones who was ruining that dream. Things came to a head in one of the more dramatic Monday nights of Louisiana politics history. Huey realised that he could not get the tax passed. He also knew that a legislature that was not in session could not impeach a sitting governor. His man, Speaker Fournay, called for the legislature to adjourn. As he did so, allegations about Huey ordering an assassination were being yelled out on the House floor. Fournay banged his gavel and tried to call the proceedings to order against the angry protestations of the dynamite squad. But it was no use. He could see that the only way out of it was to call a vote on the motion, the motion to adjourn, the motion that would save Huey. The state had recently installed a new electronic voting machine, and all the members pressed their buttons to vote. Exactly 67 green lights lit up in favour of adjourning the legislature and protecting Huey from impeachment. The only problem was that there were not 67 men who had voted to adjourn. The voting machine appeared to have been rigged. Amidst cries of foul play and treachery, I kid you not, Fournay literally threw down his gavel, declared the legislature adjourned, and scurried away. All hell broke loose. Oh God, don't let them get away with this, cried one legislator. 
Protesters surged towards the speaker's chair. Fournay returned, realising they were not dispersing, and was surrounded by a protective wall of prolonged legislators as the protesters advanced towards them. Soon, inevitably, in a way that's probably better missing from modern politics in the West, it came to blows, physical violence on the floor of the house. A fistfight broke out. Books, inkwells and all kinds of other projectiles flew across the room. Enough men were wounded that this day was referred to as Bloody Monday in Louisiana political folklore. Huey himself said in his autobiography that this was an uproar that no pen can adequately describe. Amidst the carnage, an anti-long delegate stood on the desk and bellowed for order. Miraculously, the fighting stopped, and the anti-long man began to manually count the votes. When he'd finished, amidst the violence, it was clear that the anti-long forces were triumphant. There were 79 votes to remain in session, and just 9 to adjourn. They would not go away quietly. They would be coming back tomorrow. And there, they may well decide to impeach Huey. Things were little better the next day. One senator remarked, I'll bet there were 500 pistols in that crowd. Speaker Fournay, having presumably changed his trousers, apologised for last night's irregularities. The voting machine, he explained, was faulty. It had just displayed the results of a previous vote. No one had tried to rig the machine. Why would anyone do that? This seems like a sketchy explanation on the face of it. Okay, so the machine was new, it was operated by a rather arcane and fault-prone system. But then again, in all honesty, I can't really believe that Huey would be stupid enough to try and rig an important vote. Surely he must have known that the people wouldn't fall for it. If the vote was rigged, maybe it was by a supporter who didn't know what they were doing. Not that it mattered. The events of Bloody Monday were a political disaster for Huey. When a long supporter asked again for adjournment, it received only 39 votes, nowhere near enough. Then the dynamite squad, Huey's sworn enemies, took to the floor. With them, they brought an incredible body of charges against Huey. So often you expect impeachment proceedings to involve a carefully built legal case that indicates exactly how the person involved has broken the law. This was more a case of throwing everything at Huey they could possibly think of. The rap sheet included carrying a concealed weapon, violently abusing citizens, fondling a New Orleans stripper, and blasphemy by comparing himself to Jesus. Alongside this, there were more serious allegations. Huey had illegally influenced judges, bribed legislatures, pillaged private property using the state militia, attempted to intimidate the media, misused state funds, and hired his bodyguard to kill Sanders. Even the members of the Dynamite Squad would later admit that this last charge, the assassination, was unsubstantiated and wouldn't hold up in court, but that the bodyguard made a good witness. Long's political enemies, like those in the New Orleans political machine, held a huge rally where the speakers denounced his demagoguery and dictatorship. The press rejoiced. By overthrowing the tyranny of Long, one paper said that Louisiana was returning to greatness. Some of the charges may have been false or frivolous, but there was enough truth in the allegations to bury Huey, and real momentum behind the campaign to do so. Huey's tricks with the legislature weren't working, he couldn't get them to disperse. Huey couldn't sleep. He spent his nights pacing the corridor in his hotel room with a revolver shoved in his back pocket. There was a very real possibility that his political career was over. Thanks for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynowoutlook.com, follow us on Twitter at Autocracy Now, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating, review on iTunes or your favourite podcatcher, tell your friends to listen to us. That way I don't have to hire dozens of Twitter bots with fishy names to promote the show. No one wants to see that. Tell your enemies. Next time, we'll watch as Huey Long tries to fight off impeachment charges and consolidate his control over Louisiana. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zenadia Trokai and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A.bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. <laughs>